Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be back in Bath. What a wonderful city it is, just breathtaking. Um, you're very lucky to uh, live here and visit it. Um, when Hugh asked me to give the opening plenary for this um, symposium, I was in some doubt about my competence, because I've never really been a, been, have claimed to be a specialist in youth. Um, but in the end, he convinced me that my interest in children, um, uh, uh, particularly teenage children, could be defined as an interest in youth. Uh, and uh, he thought that what I had to say would in some way resonate with the theme of this conference. So I, I hope it does. Um, I'm going to be um, talking about a field of research that I've been engaged in for the last 10 years, where we really need a bit of help in thinking about where we go next, because I'm not sure that we um, have achieved a great deal. Um, so I'm, it's kind of hair shirt uh, lecture, this. Uh, but I'll start with um, the overall argument of my lecture. Uh, as uh, you well know, there's a new interest in uh, subjective well-being or happiness, uh, both nationally uh, and internationally. Um, and some of this interest is focused on children and youth. Um, how happy are our children how do they, how do, and young people? How do they, their levels of happiness compare uh, with, other, uh, with other countries? And there is some evidence which I'll be presenting that uh, uh, the subjective well-being of young people varies between countries. Uh, why does it vary between countries? And it also varies within uh, a country, Britain in particular, uh, over time. We've got evidence of that, and I'll be presenting uh, that. And we know that um, subjective well-being, levels of happiness in a society, are associated uh, with uh, objective conditions in that society, and I'll be presenting some evidence uh, of that, at least at an international level. But when we get down to micro uh, uh, analysis, analysis of, of, of national samples uh, of the uh, uh, population of young people in a country, we actually find it very difficult to explain variations in their uh, well-being. And this has led to the problem that I think we're facing, that we actually don't know how or whether uh, social policies um, can influence uh, the level of well-being of uh, children and young people in a society. Uh, a little bit about definitions. We use these terms objective and subjective uh, well-being. Um, well-being is a multidimensional um, state. Uh, objective well-being is usually um, represented by uh, material circumstances, health, uh, education for adults, employment status, uh, people's safety, feelings of safety, uh, housing and environmental conditions, uh, participation, inclusion and other uh, parts of life like that, whereas subjective well-being is, is about feelings and people make a distinction between hedonic and eudaimonic uh, elements of subjective well-being. Hedonic elements are either affective, um, uh, uh, affective feelings, positive and negative feelings, or cognitive life satisfaction. And eudaimonic are usually represented by uh, the wider, object, um, wider ideas about your feelings about your life, uh, your purpose in life, the extent to which you feel you're flourishing. Subjective well-being can be objectively measured uh, it, just as well as income can be objectively measured. So although we call it subjective well-being, it in, fa in fact is represented uh, as objectively as any other domain uh, of well-being. And in practice, uh, in most, uh, the most of the data that's available on uh, subjective well-being is usually concerned with cognitive, uh, the cognitive domains of well-being, um, uh, and in particular, life satisfaction. 
Um, well, why is there a new interest in subjective well-being? Um, in the past, uh, the outcomes of social policy have often been evaluated using money metrics. So poverty is normally measured uh, using income or expenditure. Uh, inequality is usually uh, measured using uh, the distribution of income and the inputs uh, in social policy are usually measured using such indicators of spending per capita. Uh, uh, income we know is not a reliable indicator of command over resources. Uh, it doesn't take account of dissaving and borrowing and gifts and it is only part of the resources that are available to to us uh, to determine our living standards. And using GDP um, per capita to measure the level of development of a society uh, leaves a whole lot of things out. Uh, so personal love and care is not, to get, not taken into account in GDP. Uh, the quality of the environment, environment and the absence of pollution and things that we value like freedom and justice are not picked up uh, by uh, GDP. And then there is the observation that GDP, uh, um, after a certain level, doesn't uh, lead to increased happiness, the so-called Easterlin paradox, illustrated by this uh, uh, chart, which you'll be familiar with, uh, which shows in the vertical axis uh, life satisfaction of the population. This is not young people, this is the population. Um, uh, plotted against GDP per capita and life satisfaction improves as GDP per capita uh, rises, but after a certain level it tails off. Now there's, the, there's, the, there's still a debate in the literature about whether that's a real p true picture of what's, what's happened. There are some economists uh, in the States who have who found recently that actually GDP improvements do result in, still result in, um, in uh, uh, improvements in life satisfaction. We've been influenced in, in Britain uh, uh, by the work of Richard Layard, um, uh, who wrote his book Happiness in 2005 and was appointed by Tony Blair when he was Prime Minister as the Happiness Tsar. Uh, and his book was a critique of mainstream economics. He posed the prosperity paradox, the Easterlin's paradox, that we strive constantly to, uh, for economic growth and improved uh, incomes, uh, and uh, we've got much richer than we were in the past, but actually we're no longer, we're not, not, as ha we're, we're not happier uh, than we, we were in the past. And uh, this, these ideas were taken up uh, by the OECD in the Stiglitz uh, commission uh, report where they recommended that the OECD begins to measure economic performance and social pro pro progress by uh, measuring well-being, taking account of these uh, domains and including subjective well-being, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 those domains. And they've begun to uh, publish um, international comparisons of uh, uh, life satisfaction in their OECD How Life, How's Life series. I don't know whether you can see these countries. Uh, uh, China, there are some people from China here. Hungary, uh, Portugal, India, Estonia, South Africa, uh, Russia, Indonesia, Turkey, Greece. Um, uh, Mexico, uh, Britain, Denmark, Canada, Norway, uh, Czechoslovakia, Sweden, the Netherlands, Australia at the top of the league. Big differences in the mean levels of life satisfaction uh, internationally. And David Cameron, uh, our Prime Minister, when he was in opposition, uh, uh, made, made, a, made a speech about the importance of uh, well-being. This is what he said, it's time we admitted that there's more to life than money. And it's time we focus not just on GDP, but on GWB, general well-being. It's about the beauty of our surroundings, the quality of our culture, and above all, the strength of our relationships. 
there is a deep satisfaction which comes from belonging to someone and to some place. And uh, uh, he, um, when he was elected, asked the Office of National Statistics to begin to measure uh, the well-being uh, of the population in Britain. So here are some arguments of why, uh, why well-being matters. Uh, promoting well-being is surely a reasonable goal for any society. Studying well-being can enable us to understand what matters in people's lives. And in the UK, we've now begun to uh, two programs of uh, research uh, to measure uh, subjective well-being of adults and children. And these are the criteria that, the, that are being used to um, assess well-being by the Office of National Statistics. Um, so personal well-being is being measured using life satisfaction, is life worthwhile, happiness yesterday and happiness with appearance, those are the subjective elements. And then there's relationships, health, what, what do we do, where do we live, personal finance, education, skills, economy, governance, natural environment. And there's a website I've put there where you can look it up. And uh, uh, the same domains are used to monitor children and youth. Um, and more progress has been made with the adult uh, measurement of well-being than, than has been made uh, with children and youth. But ONS are publishing uh, a new paper in a couple of weeks' time, which will be the first, their first major report on children and youth. And uh, if you go to the website, you'll see this uh, 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 um, chart, which is a summary uh, produced annually of the status of well-being of the population of the UK. Now, we have been um, involved in uh, research for a number of years on uh, children's uh, well-being. We weren't uh, the pioneers. The, uh, the UNICEF has been publishing a report on the state of the world's children uh, since 1990. Um, uh, the Inocenti report cards uh, from the Inocenti, UNICEF Inocenti Centre in Florence have also been produced every year or so. Uh, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, comparing uh, the well-being of children in the OECD, and I'll be report introducing some of their results. Uh, the OECD has, uh, has produced one report on the well-being of children in OECD countries and is working on the, on the second. Uh, the European Union hasn't done much uh, comparative work on uh, well, child well-being yet, uh, but it publishes uh, extensive data on child poverty and deprivation and has commissioned some work from Tarki, a uh, Hungarian research unit, um, on child well-being. Uh, there's a um, very good report produced by uh, the African um, uh, uh, Children's Research Unit in Addis Ababa on comparing the well-being of children in Africa, which, for those of you who come from uh, Africa, you might uh, want to know about. Um, and there have been various international indices of, uh, of uh, um, multidimensional child poverty and child well-being produced, one of them from Bristol. Uh, and, of course, internationally, there are many, many, many uh, national reports now produced uh, by countries on the well-being of their populations. A bit about the research that we've done. Um, uh, we've done t three um, books comparing the well-being of children and young people in Britain um, over time, and we're working on uh, a, th uh, um, a fourth uh, volume to be published next year. Um, we've uh, undertaken comparative studies of child well-being in the EU, the OECD, uh, the CCIS countries and Pacific Rim countries, and I'll be presenting some of that research here. We've done a, uh, an, a produced an index of variations in uh, child well-being at small area level, uh, similar to the index of deprivation. Um, we've done a series of surveys in collaboration with the Children's Society of large samples of children and young people in Britain looking at their subjective well-being, and I'll be presenting some of that uh, um, data, 
and uh, we've also uh, analysed trends in subjective well-being of children uh, over time in Britain. Uh, okay, well, this is the um, first uh, international comparative uh, study of, uh, produced by the Innocenti uh, Centre in 2007 uh, of child well-being in rich countries, um, and it has uh, um, uh, different domains, material well-being, health and safety, educational well-being, family and peer relationships, behaviours and risks, and subjective well-being, and those different domains are made up by a number of different indicators combined uh, to represent each domain and overall ranking of countries uh, 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 on uh, the average of the different domains and we were very shocked uh, in 2007 when the reports of this uh, survey came out and we found the UK at the bottom of the league table. Um, even lower than the United States of America that normally comes at the bottom of these international league tables, for very good reasons. Uh, and note the Netherlands uh, um, consistently uh, Dutch children and young people are at the top of international league tables. Uh, one of the questions is we don't know why that is. Uh, how did they achieve it? The Netherlands is a small flat country just across the North Sea from us uh, and uh, is just much, much more successful than we are uh, in achieving happiness among its um, uh, children. Uh, so uh, that index was repeated in 2013 with a different range of countries um, and slightly different indicators. And in this uh, um, index, we didn't include subjective well-being as one of the domains. We, we kept it separate, but I'll, I'll give you those results uh, later. So material situation, health, education, baby, housing, environment, and overall child well-being. Uh, the United Kingdom, by 2013, had moved up the league table to the middle. Uh, and we think we know why that was. Uh, it was I'll, I'll come on to talk about that later in my talk. Uh, but we think that's probably the result of policy. It's not an artifact of measurement. Uh, I mean, big investment in education took place between those two periods. Uh, a huge investment in anti-poverty strategy, uh, improvement, big increases in health spending, uh, huge in institutional transformation uh, in um, ch children's services. Uh, we think the improvement is something to do with that. Uh, uh, Netherlands still at the top of the league table, the only country in the top third of the distribution across all the domains. Uh, the United States of America, here. Um, uh, um. Then, this is the OECD index. I won't go through uh, this in great, uh, 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 great detail. They, they don't put the countries in, 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 in rank order, uh, uh, and they don't have, they only have one a uh, tiny element of subjective well-being is what's what children say about their schools. Uh, um, uh, but uh, there are some Mexico's here, Korea's here, uh, uh, um, uh, United States. Um, and we've done a comparison of the Pacific Rim um, which includes China, um, Korea, um, uh, uh, and, and perhaps some other countries here that I uh, didn't catch uh, in, the, in the audience. This isn't in rank order, but we've, we've put the countries in rank order according to the different domains. Uh, this was a rather an experimental attempt to uh, compare these countries because the uh, available data on these countries is not um, very good. Um, and uh, uh, 
there are some interesting inconsistencies. In this league table, China is the top of the child subjective well-being uh, domain, which doesn't, uh, doesn't resonate very well with the findings of the OECD uh, index. And we've also done an index for the CCIS countries. I don't think there's anybody from the CCIS countries here, um, so uh, I'll move on rapidly. Now, um, how do you explain uh, this variation, international variation, in young people's subjective uh, well-being? Well, it does appear to be related to some extent to the level of GDP. So here we've plotted uh, the overall well-being of the European Union countries against their level of GDP and the countries that uh, are richer uh, tend to be, have higher child well-being. Um, uh, R squared is uh, 0.5 uh, and, but there are a lot of outliers. The Netherlands is doing much better for its children than its GDP would suggest it was able to do. And the UK is doing much worse uh, than it should be, given its level of uh, national resources. Um, there is a closer relationship between uh, overall well-being and the relative child poverty rate. Uh, um, a bit closer, R squared is still 0.5. Um, but again, there are outliers. Uh, with some countries doing much better than they, they might expect to be doing and other countries doing much worse. Uh, there is a less strong uh, relationship with inequality. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a chart which was used by Wilkinson and Pickett uh, in their book um, and uh, the Gini coefficient uh, with, uh, with overall well-being is point. Uh, three, three, with a lot of uh, outliers. Interestingly, when the, um, we published the uh, UNICEF 2007 report, which found the UK at the bottom of the league table, our gutter press, uh, the Daily Mail, said it was because of feckless British families, uh, lack of care for their children and break, marital breakdown. So we plotted uh, overall well-being against the proportion of broken families. That's children living in lone parent or step-parent situations, and we found no relationship at all internationally. Uh, there are some countries with lots of broken families whose, chil whose children have very uh, high levels of life satisfaction, happiness, and vice versa. This is another hint that it might be policy that is making the difference. Those countries which make an effort to protect uh, the ch their children living in lone parent families against poverty uh, have more successful outcomes. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't expect um, uh, uh, social policy to have an impact on subjective well-being. And I'm going to go quite quickly uh, through these points. Firstly, our measures of subjective well-being are not very good. Uh, typically, they're 10-point uh, um, uh, Likert scales uh, in which children are asked to place themselves on a range from very happy to very unhappy. Uh, and uh, the majority of children place themselves well above the mean in all countries. And so the distribution is very skewed. And we just don't know how... We don't really know how reliable they are. Then, in international comparisons, we're using concepts which may not resonate, may not mean the same thing in different countries. If you translate life satisfaction into Italian uh, or Chinese uh, or Indonesian, you may not be asking about the same uh, conception. Um, then there is the argument that um, uh, subjective well-being is, is a function of adaptive, adapt, adapt, adaptation. Uh, we've done a comparative study which has included Uganda 
and Ugandan children, despite the fact that they're incredibly poor uh, and lacking access to all sorts of services, uh, ha have extraordinarily high levels of, of subjective well-being. Uh, uh, they have adapted to their circumstances. And there may be a limit to the extent to which we can compare uh, um, uh, countries with very different levels of economic um, development using these uh, subjective measures. Then there's the argument uh, of Cummings in Australia that, uh, that actually subjective well-being happiness is, a, is, a, is, an, is, is um, the result of a homeostatic adaptation. Um, over the millennia, um, those, in, those human beings who, who uh, 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 adapted best uh, to disasters uh, um, genetically survived, survived more successfully. And we have an inbuilt, inbuilt capacity in us to, to bounce back from disasters uh, and there's some evidence that that's actually true for children as well. Children who lose their parents uh, uh, are, do, do bounce back with extraordinary um, resilience. Then there is the evidence which I'm going to present that it's actually very difficult to explain variations uh, in subjective well-being at the micro uh, level. Then there is evidence that uh, we know, there is evidence that personality uh, has an impact on uh, levels of happiness um, and uh, then we know through the research that I'm going to show you that there are some aspects of well-being are more important than others in determining overall life satisfaction and they're not the kind of things that policy can do very much about. So when you ask children what matters most in their lives they will say their family relationships, their relationships with their family, top of the league. They'll then say the amount of choice they're given in their lives uh, by their parents, actually. And neither of those two elements are, are much uh, effect affectable by uh, policy. Whereas they don't seem to be much worried about material resources. Mater their material resources don't seem to uh, contribute much to their overall well-being. So, this is an example of our problems. This is a big survey of children, 10,000 children aged uh, uh, 10, 12 and 14 in England, undertaken with, in collaboration with the Children's Society. And it's a, a regression, the regression results of variation in subjective well-being. This is, that's the dependent variable. And in this regression model, we've just taken some demographic variables Age matters. Older children are more miserable than younger children. Um, ethnicity doesn't matter. Uh, uh, the number of children in the household doesn't matter. It's not true that um, single children are happier than children with siblings. Um, gender matters a bit. Girls are generally more unhappy than boys. Uh, whether the, ch the children report difficulties at school or physical difficulties doesn't seem to matter. And we succeed in explaining 9%, only 9% of the variation in overall well-being with all those socio-demographic factors in the model. Um, then we add a deprivation score, which uh, is a score that asks the children about the, whether they are lacking a list of an index of socially perceived necessities. And that, that does explain a bit more. It increases our proportion explained to 17%. And um, then we add family composition. It does make a difference, uh, but it only increases the R squared to 19%. So with all the kind of usual standard socio-demographic factors in a model, we're not really explaining a lot of subjective well-being. And I've just repeated this kind of analysis on the latest uh, Millennium Cohort Survey sweep, the 11-year-old sweep, which is a huge sample of 11-year-olds in the United Kingdom with very good socio-demographic data uh, and a good, good measures of subjective well-being, 
uh, derived from interviews with children and using all these kinds of variables including parental poverty and parental deprivation we only managed to explain two percent two percent of the variation in subjective well-being here is a sort of illustration I, uh, I hope you can take this in this is an illustration of of how uh, overall subjective well-being is uh, is is affected by different elements of children's lives uh, um, so bullying bullying has been consistently found to explain a lot of the variation uh, in subjective well-being uh, so uh, um, uh, the, the, the children who have experienced bullying are more likely to have low well-being that's been the tail of the distribution children who don't like going to school children who don't feel free to express their opinions uh, children who say they have less money than their friends all all are more likely to be in the tail of the distribution but there are things here that you can do about you can do something about bullying in school um, and uh, I'm not sure you can do anything about whether they feel they have enough friends using social policies and here is the um, uh, analysis of subjective well-being that was we produced out of the last UNICEF uh, lead table and what again it shows is there is fantastic variation in uh, the levels of such subjective well-being across these countries this is data from the health behavior of school children survey uh, and uh, 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 these are Z scores of subjective well-being and once again we get the Netherlands that well, Macedonia the Netherlands at the top of the uh, league table and British children uh, US children there near the bottom and England Scotland and Wales all below average of uh, um, subjective well-being so we can't explain variations in subjective well-being very successfully at national level using micro data but when we use this micro data this is analysis of micro data huge large samples in each country when we analyze variations at national level uh, using micro data we pick up big differences why uh, is this here is an exa one example of a new survey that we've just been doing called the children's world survey this is the results of the pilot uh, uh, survey and this is the mean subjective well-being score uh, in the countries that were in the pilot Romania Spain Israel Brazil uh, USA Algeria South Africa Chile England South Korea and Uganda um, and uh, Britain uh, is uh, third from bottom uh, not as not as low as South Korea South Korean children are miserable so are so Japanese children uh, and I think we know why they're miserable it's because of the horrible uh, lives they have in school and after school constant requirement to educate themselves under intense pressure uh, all the time um, uh, uh, South African children middle of the distribution this is a sample from uh, uh, very poor uh, areas of South Africa Uganda not at all bad I mean it's the bottom of the league table but uh, um, not majority of children in Uganda are happy what explains these variations and these variations are correlated with other characteristics of those countries so we've compared the subjective well-being uh, with at an international level with the uh, 
material well-being, health and safety, education, behaviour, housing and environment, and overall well-being, the average of all those excluding subjective well-being. And you see there are strong correlations between subjective well-being and all those domains. Those countries that are, uh, have got less child poverty have children who are happier. Those children who have got better health uh, 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 have got uh, their children are happier, and so on. Uh, uh, um, it appears that structural factors do, uh, at an international level, s seem to explain some of the uh, variation in overall well-being. And here is a chart showing the same thing. Uh, here's the overall well-being index, the objective elements of it, and here's the subjective well-being scores with Netherlands right at the top of the league table and R squared of 0.3 with some outliers. Uh, there's, e there's even a weak uh, positive correlation between spending on families uh, um, and spending on education as a percentage of GDP and uh, subjective well-being. Those countries that are making more effort in public spending affecting children have slightly higher, tend to have slightly higher uh, uh, well-being with lots, with lots of outliers. Then there is the evidence um, that well-being has improved uh, in uh, the United Kingdom over time. Uh, this is um, taken from a, uh, the British Household Panel Survey, which began asking children aged 11 to, six, 11 to 15 about their uh, subjective well-being in 1994. So we've got a time series that goes right up to uh, uh, 2011 so, so far, uh, and it became the Understanding Society Survey in 2009, a much bigger sample. And uh, you can see from the uh, confidence intervals that the level of subjective well-being in 2008 uh, um, was substantially higher than it was in 1994. Um, um, why did this occur? Um, what explains it? Well, um, we think it may have something to do with the huge investment in uh, poverty reduction, child poverty reduction as a result of New Labour's policies after 1997. Um, there was big increases in spending of children in the uh, uh, later 1990s and uh, uh, mid uh, mid-2000s, uh, spending on education, schools, big program of school building, much better uh, teacher-to-student ratios. As I said, there was an institutional transformation of services for children. Um, uh, and um, we found when we look at the breakdown of what elements of subjective well-being have improved, that it's the children's views about their schools that improve most, and, a, and a, 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 an improvement in children's views about their friendships that had improved most. Schools and friendships. So we wonder whether it was uh, uh, the investment in schools and the um, in increased use of social and emotional education in schools and anti-bullying strategies which became a statutory requirement in schools, uh, uh, possibly. What explains the improvement in friendships, in relationships? And particularly it was an improvement in relationships for girls. Girls started saying much more positive things about their friendships than they'd said uh, earlier in the period. And we think it might have something to do with the development of social networking, which enabled girls in particular to maintain uh, interactions with their girlfriends and friends uh, in a way which they were unable, unable to do in dark winter nights in England when children aren't allowed to go out in the streets and meet their chums because uh, of fears about their safety. But they can do it through um, uh, social networking. 
And the interesting thing about that chart, I suppose, is there is some evidence uh, uh, that it's getting worse now. Since the crisis, uh, there appears to have been a fall-off in subjective well-being. The gap between uh, girls and boys, which had been closing, is now beginning to open up again. Um, and uh, um, it's slightly difficult to be certain that this is a real fall because, as I said, the survey base changed um, as a break in series, really. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not a good picture, and there's lots of other evidence uh, that children are being affected very badly by the austerity crisis in Britain. Suicide rates are going up. Um, uh, um, child poverty rates are, uh, are beginning to rise. Um, most of the cuts in public expenditure have fallen on families with children. Uh, uh, they've been the main victims of austerity and it, 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 it will have a knock-on effect. Much of the improvements that have occurred, that occurred during the labour years, have now been swept away um, by uh, austerity. So this is my last slide. Uh, um, no, this is my last slide. And it's ready to admit that we've still got much to learn. Uh, we've got much to learn about how we measure uh, well-being. Um, we've got much to learn how uh, it can be affected by public policy and uh, how we can organize society uh, to inf influence it. Um, it does vary over time. It, and that suggests it can be varied over time. Uh, it does vary between countries. Uh, some countries seem to be doing better than others. And it's very difficult to really understand those as differences in understanding about the questions. You know, we're not that different from the Netherlands uh, in culture and living standards and aspirations and uh, whatever might affect uh, conceptions of well-being. And it varies to some extent between individuals in, in societies, but not as much as uh, 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 we might expect. So, uh, this is not just about other people, your young people, most of you. What affects your well-being? What can be done to improve it? And if you don't know, you might like to visit uh, Lord Layard's website, where he, ha he has uh, a set of instructions of things you must do every day uh, to improve your well-being and also the happiness of, of your friends and neighbours and the population in general. Thank you very much.